Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's really uh, it's so exciting to be here and see you all. I know that I sometimes, you know, like our president, have a tendency to drone <laughs> on and on. And so, so to prevent myself from droning, I made a homemade clock that I was <laughs> just going to bring here. A little homemade clock. Okay. <laughs> all right. Anyway, but up, up. Yes. Come on. This is going to be a friendly room. <laughs> Another very important thing about this book is that how you um, connect the Muslim American, Arab American experience to the African American experience, the Asian American experience, and history. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, one of the things that I've in the, uh, been really interested in a long time, too, is, uh, is where do both Arab Americans and Muslim Americans fit within the, the ethnic and religious hierarchies of this country, or even just the imagination, the ethnic and religious imaginations of this country. You know, uh, back when I was, I think I was a graduate student, I wrote a, uh, I think it was like one of my early, first, one of my first conference papers a long time ago was called, Is There an A in Asian American for Arabs? <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, because, uh, as an Arab American, back then I was Arab Canadian, I'm still Arab Canadian, but uh, as an Arab American, like, there's, a, there's almost no sense of, sense of where you belong within America's ethnic uh, um, uh, fabric, as it were. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, Arab Americans are a very, very complex group. And at the same time, they're, they're completely uh, uh, imbricated within so much of the power structure here, especially post 9-11, and yet at the same time, they're almost invisible on so many other levels. Uh, and so one way that you get gain visibility in this ethnically um, uh, uh, you know, saturated in environment in the United States is recognition as, a, as an ethnicity. And, that, and the Arab Americans have not had that kind of recognition, in, I don't think, in the ways in which they should. And Arab Americans often, you know, they, uh, they connect, of course, both Asia and Africa. And so they would be a way of thinking about what's, what's the relationship between Asian Americans and Arab Americans? What's the relationship between Arab Americans and African Americans? And in fact, those, b those histories are completely fascinating. And there's, there's so many things that one can start to look at, including b going back all the way to the days of slavery, which I talk about in the book a little bit as well. You know, there's, there, were, there were many uh, slaves within the United States, people who were brought to the United States as slaves, who, uh, who were um, Muslim and who were writing in, uh, in Arabic. And then when they were writing in Arabic, as they were discovered that, that, that they could read and write in Arabic, the general culture, the American culture, would, con would no longer con consider them Africans. They would then consider them Arabs mm -hmm. because Africans were not considered to be literate at that time. So this is a totally fascinating part of American history that it seems to me is very overlooked. But more specifically to the point that you're making, I, you know, I think one of the, uh, or the question you're asking is, one of the other things that I was interested in looking at too uh, was the development of, of you know, the legal category of suspicion, you could say, of Muslim Americans in this post-9-11 world has involved a whole, a whole slew of different kinds of law enforcement um, um, paradigms and regimes, uh, including special registration. I don't know if people are familiar with special registration, but right after, uh, one year after 9-11, the government was requiring that all Muslim males from 25 majority Muslim countries, all males from 25 majority Muslim countries, and North Korea, but that's a, that's a null category because there's no North Koreans in the United States, uh, or very, very few. And so um, they were requiring all males over the age of 14 to register with the government if you're on an immigrant visa. Uh, and this, is, this was an extraordinary thing, uh, and yet it, it, it's almost undiscussed within outside of the, the community, and it had a huge impact on the community. In fact, people were, once again, many people were going over, going over the border to Canada. Just, uh, again, you get this flight from the United States to Canada, which has happened over and over, whether it be from slavery or from the, from the 1960s uh, uh, Vietnam War, etc. Anyway. I was looking into it, and if you look at the legal authority that the government was using for special registration, it actually goes back to Chinese exclusion. It goes back to Chinese exclusion. Uh, I don't think, by and large, American society has really understood the, the degree to which it has changed because of the, the so-called war on terror. Um, I really don't think that people, you know, they're just caught up in the moment of it, and I really don't think that they understand the, the, 
you know, the extent of, of, its, um, of its impact on American society on so many levels, um, and especially on the level with essentially creating a new, a new category of fear and suspicion uh, with Muslim Americans. And so I think that there are ways in which we really have to think about um, you know, the, the histories of racializations within this country so that we look at our present and look at our present very uh, critically, but also look historically at what's going on. So questions? Comments? Can I add just something? <coughs> in uh, a, a scholar by the name of Monica Araki, who was writing about Arabs in the curriculum in the United States, and I did a piece on Arabs in the New York State curriculum. And if you look at textbooks, and she did this, is Irish Americans are hyphenated, African Americans, but you cannot have in any U.S. textbooks, or you don't find it, Arab Americans. Uh, you might refer to someone, uh, uh, Martin Luther King, an African American, but Ralph Nader cannot be referred to as a Lebanese American. Right. And that's very important in terms of identity. And I did research on the New York State regents of every time uh, Arab or Arab American was mentioned. And any free time Arabs are mentioned, it's in the context of conflict and in the context of war. Mm -hmm. And I think there are only two times mm -hmm. where um, the, um, uh, the achievements of the uh, Muslim world in terms of mathematics, art, and stuff mm -hmm. were mentioned um, in the curriculum. And uh, for example, in one very popular middle school textbook, the only mention of an Arab uh, American was uh, Sirhan Sirhan. And they said he was a Muslim. And he wasn't. He was a Christian. So I mean, it's the whole issue of identity yeah. is also in the schools where our children go right. and in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. You know, I do a lot of, I've, I've done a whole bunch of, um, of high school visits as well. And I was, I'm not going to tell you which high school, because I feel like it was, I don't know, it just feels proper not to. But there was one high school that I went to where the, um, and it, this is an elite high school, a very expensive high school, and where the, the principal, I, you know, very nice guy, and we sat there and we talked for a while, and the principal was telling me how they ha they're very proud of their diversity in this school, and they have like all kinds of p students from everywhere, and they really cultivate that the students be very proud of where they're from, and they have very little uh, conflict in those, on those terms. He said, but he knows that there are a bunch of students in the school who are Muslim, right, but who will, won't tell anybody that they're Muslim. They won't tell anybody. And he's like, this is the only group that I know of where the people will, are like running away from their identities. And I've also heard that, I've heard other stories in the, mar in the workplace, for, uh, very similar stories too, you know. So this is the kind of, this is, this, that's what this Muslim American life is about right now, you know. Yeah, no. Could you theorize that just a little bit? And then what's the prognosis? I mean, when do you expect finally that category will exist? Is it going to be happening in the near future? That is to say, the U.S. census kind of struggle for recognition. Like, what are the debates around that? Right. Um, yeah, well, I mean, certainly there'll never be a Muslim American census uh, because that's a religious category. But um, in terms of the two terms, the of Mus Arab and Muslim, you know, and like Huda was saying, like even Arab is itself very complicated. But I, I, uh, you know, am both Arab and Muslim, you know, and I, so I feel like I want to make sure that I talk about myself fully in those ways. But it's but most people. How many years are we now into this freaking war on terror? It's like we're almost. It's almost 15 years into the war on terror, and I tell you, I lecture across the country. Uh, and still, I would say 50% of the time that I lecture is just based on in informing the audience of what the difference is between a Muslim and an Arab. I'm not kidding. People have no idea. They have no idea. And at first, I was like shocked and angry by that. And, and then I'm, now I feel like it's just my duty because they, somebody has to tell them. It's just what I do now. You know, I try to do it in an entertaining way. I talk about like Shakira and things like that, you know. But. Uh, um, yeah, I do actually, but I'm not going to do it to you for you now. <laughs> but um, but it's very important, uh, you know, this idea which they also get conflated, um, and it happens all the time. It's like you know when um, even you know when John McCain gets berated uh, at a town hall meeting, I don't trust that man. 
when he remember back in 2008 about the Obama thing, he is an Arab. Of course, she didn't really mean Arab. He, she meant Muslim, right? Uh, so, and that continues until to this day. I can tell you, like by personal experience, that people just don't know the difference. So, if if you want me to like to theorize it, I think it's a theory still of ignorance, frankly, you know. Um, but and but it's and you know you can only get you can you can only start to talk about it separately in very complicated ways or kind of like disassociation ways. You know, you might say, oh well, I'm Arab, but I'm Christian, so I don't have anything to do with that. And so sometimes you've seen that response within the community. Uh, uh, um, and of course, Muslim Americans are Muslim Americans are, you know, they come from at least 69 different countries of origin in the United States. It's the most it's the most by national origin diverse uh, religious community in the country. It has roots that go all the way back, as I was saying, to slavery until like refugee arrival today, as we all know. Um, now, even in Canada, I saw a report today that said Canada is refugee policy. They're now thinking about about discriminating on the basis of religion which Syrians are going to let into the country. How horrible is that? It's terrible. In Canada, too. I mean, Canada's actually, it's like gone off the cliff terrible, actually, in the last little while. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but yeah, I think that that, you know, I think the fact that that, that ignorance still exists is actually ex very, very telling. It's Gene. How are you doing? Good, how, how are, are you? You're doing fine, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one of the things I wanted to you to speak on is like the cycle um, of, you know, basically you desensitizing the American public towards a particular group. So in a sense, is when you look at the war on terror, we can go back to the 1980s and remember Rocky with, the, with uh, talking about the Russians. And it seems like with this imagery on television, whether it's film, newspaper, the, the people that's really served by this are voters being empathetic or disassociating themselves with uh, military, uh, all of this expense, because it seems like the people that made money over the last 15 years was a lot of the military industrial complex, yeah. mm -hmm. a trillion, two trillion dollars in a war, mm -hmm. just by dehumanizing a whole flock of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, and I, th I think the levels of dehumanization have become like on a very, very b basic level, too, you know, so that it's just part of the cultural discourse now, you know. I mean, people are definitely making money off of it. Uh, and you can look at shows, I, you know, like Homeland, for example, that television show Homeland, which is basically telling you that any Muslim in the United States is a potential threat to you, right? Um, and uh, you know they don't they don't make those shows as public service announcements, right? So there's like there's a, there's a reason why they make those shows. But th but the point is also that those shows have an audience at the same time. It's not so it's not only coming in one direction. There's like there's like a there's a you know there's a there's a an equation there that we should be examining. But I think the cycles of things that you're looking at is actually also really important to acknowledge because. You know, this came through to me when I was writing uh, How Does It Feel to Be a Problem. We, when I talked to the, all, a lot of young people um, for writing How Does It Feel to Be a Problem, I would hear over and over again, they would say, now it's our turn. You know, before it was uh, Italian Americans, before it was the Catholics, it was the Jews, it was, uh, you know, they were uh, Japanese. They would, they would go through the litany of like, you know, all the different um, uh, communities that have been really uh, targeted within the country. And they would say, now it's our turn. And I thought, and I heard this m multiple, multiple times. And I thought, wow, that's, that's, that, that's really good and it's really bad that they're saying that. I say it's really good because it means that they're, they're historicizing rather than exceptionalizing their own predicament. That they're looking at their situation and they're saying, let's put this in a historical context. Let's not just see ourselves as exceptional and therefore like we're the only ones who are victims ever. So that's mature, especially this is like a lot of like, you know, 19, 20 year olds were talking to me about this and I think that's great. What I think it's unfortunate is it's a kind of acceptance that this is going to continue to happen. And we're living in a post-civil rights era when, I mean, maybe I'm naive. I know I'm naive, but we're not supposed to make new communities of suspicion this way. So we shouldn't even accept the fact that it's happened uh, before as a way of saying that, you know, it's, it's almost okay. You know what I'm saying? Thank you very much. So I'm happy to sign books. Thank <laughs> you.